Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to call the virtual Zoom meeting of the Task Force on Municipal Golf in Madison Parks to order. It's uh, Monday, May the 18th, 2020. I thank you all for coming. I'd like to just say right now that uh, Paul Schmidt and Park staff and Paul's with IT. They've done a lot of work behind the scenes to enable us to push our mission forward in a time of pandemic. Um, and I, I'm grateful to them and I'm grateful to you all for making time to come together tonight and uh, continue our good work. So with that, Miss Levy, will you call the roll and determine quorum? Sure, thanks. I'm just going to unmute all the panelists for a moment so I can take roll. All right. Bill Barker? Yeah. Present. Katie Kruger? Like she is not on yet. Dan Steinbring? Present. Elder Zachary Hennett? Present. Present. Noah Lopez? Here. Present. Veronica Vega? There she is. Present. James Cox. Here. Present. Ray Shane. Here. Present. And Chandra Miller Fiannon. Here. Present. Great. All right. We have a quorum, and I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone again. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Um, second item on our agenda is to consider the minutes of February the uh, 19th, I think it is. So those were distributed by mail today. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to read that instruction thing. Oh, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, One second. All right, uh, welcome to our virtual meeting. We're gonna cover a few basic items before beginning. Two members and city staff. muting and unmuting committee members. Use the raise hand feature when you like to speak or ask questions. Voting will be considered unanimous. Click raise hand to object or request a roll call. During any roll call, all panelists will be unmuted. Staff, click raise hand when you are asked a question. The chair will do their best to call on committee members in the order in which hands are raised. Lowering your hand will take you out of the queue. If you lose connection at any point during the meeting, you can reconnect by clicking the link in your original email. Members of the public who have registered to speak, the name you entered in Zoom must match the name you entered in registration. You will remain muted until called upon. The clerk will tell you when your time is up. After speaking, a member of the body may ask you a question. If you need to share documentation with the committee, please send it to golftaskforce at cityofmadison.com. Chair, the floor is yours. It's of uh, February 19th, 2020 now. Hope you've had a chance to peruse them and I'll be listening for a motion to approve. Which I think you'll have to do by raising your hand. Alder Hennick actually raises his hand to make the motion. <laughs> And Chandra seconds the motion. So we, as uh, as the Paul pointed out, we'll be asking for a unanimous uh, assent on any motions that we vote on. Should you wish to uh, call for a roll call vote or, or object, please raise your hand. Otherwise, uh, we'll consider the minutes approved. Okay? All right. Item number three, public comment. Uh, we have a couple of registrants. Let me just get that document up here. Uh, so Mr. Dwayne Hunter of Oak Brook Circle opposes and does not wish to speak. Um, Lucas Franklin of 726 Glenway Street 
uh, neither supports nor opposes and wishes to speak. So, uh, Lucas, you have three minutes. All right. Three minutes. Here I go. Thank you. Uh, so I, I read through all the comments and, and data. Um, I wasn't able to attend the in-person town halls that we had a couple months ago uh, due to some work complex. But I just um, am a little concerned uh, with the lack of focus on um, improving the courses architecturally and how that can help with like attracting community engagement. There's been a couple cities that have been in uh, similar spots that Madison's been at, um, maybe with similar issues such as Odan and Yahara, where they really struggle with uh, flooding. And they've taken some really unique uh, approaches in improving the golf courses um, from an architecture standpoint that have actually made it really, really cheap to uh, uh, run. And they, and as a result, these are like national destinations. Um, being Winter Park is a nine-hole golf course in Winter Park, Florida, that was redone by the city. I um, mean, now as people travel all over the country uh, to go play this nine-hole uh, simple course, similar to Glenway, where it's really tucked into a neighborhood. Um, Sweetens Cove is sort of the poster's child that's in Chattanooga. I mean, it was flooded, bankrupt, and just with a few men, they were able to uh, redo it in what's uh, one of the greatest golf courses in in the country now. And what I'm sort of getting at is. I, I want us to take maybe some time to think about how, you know, pace of play and community engagement is so important. And um, a lot of our courses, how they're built, uh, don't necessarily lend themselves to that. And um, taking a pause and sort of looking at what is happening in the golf industry and uh, building longer and bigger courses is not necessarily the best. We can look just north of us in Sand Valley of just building wider and using the terrain that we have in Madison that's so unique um, and the weather of just letting our courses being uh, wider um, and faster, which actually allows a lot more generational play. So it doesn't, you don't need the college kid who can vomit 300 yards because he played college baseball, but um, with firmer turf, which is less water, which is more uh, sustainable um, and takes a lot less maintenance. Uh, generations can play the golf course and have unique difficulties um yeah so i guess it's sort of just a, a a long rant that i i hope that we could take some time to look at what we could do from rerouting the golf courses to make them easier to maintain uh more fun to play maybe shorter routing so someone can go out for like a whiskey loop and just play five holes i know someone mentioned that in the comments but and then looking at just seeing how madison can be um, really the flag bearer of how can city courses can operate um, by building upon what Winter Park did in Florida, Common Grounds out in Colorado, and especially Sweetens Cove, which struggles with so much of the similar floodings um, that we do down in, in Tennessee. But that's my thing. I, I don't have huge problems. Just want us to make sure that we're looking at all of our, our options uh, and not pouring money into to stuff that not necessarily is not going to improve the desire to go out and play and, and enjoy the, the land that we uniquely have in the city. Thank you, sir. Questions for the speaker? Anyone? Okay. Uh, next is Amy Scar. Neither supports Oops. nor opposes. Um, Alder oh, Hennick. Got raise a, his hand. There's a button on your screen that says raise hand. You should use it because that's what I'm looking for. There you go. Let me unmute you now. He's not unmuted yet. I'm going to unmute him. Let me do it. Okay, go. So, just so you know, both times I've, I've raised my hand and, and visually I've also raised my hand down here. But um, just wanted to, to ask the um, ask if the prior person who was giving comment had uh, looked at kind of some of the outlines that we'd given to what um, Madison was looking at as the kind of criteria for what we were looking for in a um, city, in a municipal course, and, and see if that was something that they had response to. It, it seems that there's just a bit of a gap between what we're talking about of a, a nationally renowned course and kind of some of the conversations that we've had earlier. And I was wondering if our um, speaker had, had thought about that a little bit. And just I just wanted to hear comments on uh, kind of the differences and, and pros and cons. Thank you. I 
don't know Luke, if I'm unmuted. Lucas is, yep, you're still unmuted. Okay, they can hear me? Yes. Okay, um, yeah, so I guess uh, I had looked at it, and I, I really, I do think <clears> we're in the right direction. I think um, moving in under different fund, um, I'm not an accountant, but it, it makes sense. Um, when I was saying nationally, I think I was just giving reference to sort of three golf courses that were in similar um, financial situations or land pr- land usage pressure and how they did something just pretty simple and actually reduced a lot of costs. And as a result, just ended up being sort of a, a standard bear nationally of what to do with municipal uh, style courses. Um, I I agree that I think Yahara, I mean, it's really hard to have enough people to go in that geographic region to play golf for 36 holes. Um, I, I just think we have some really unique land, specifically Glenway and Monona, that um, we could bring in some architects that they did for really cheap and be able to put it in a position where it's a lot less of a financial burden um, on the city from a maintenance cost. Uh, <clears throat> We can talk after this. There's there's sort of a lot of documentation of just really just simplifying the way you approach a golf course um, and focusing on the design around the greens brings a lot more attraction across all levels of play, but allows the speed of play since you're not walking from tree to tree trying to find a little white ball. Um, yeah, there's just a little tiny things that I think we're, we're definitely moving in the right direction. What scared me a little bit was sort of maybe the lack of focusing on course improvement that I think rerouting would have improve Odana's flooding. You know, you can't pump water uphill and there's holes that are below where we're uh, putting the water reservoir. So I think rerouting the golf course could help with that um, mm-hmm. and also help with pace of play. And then lastly, as I know, I'm on a time limit. Um, I think uh, a lot of maintenance costs, even though it is a cash cow for using golf carts, um, it's really hard on the golf course and really hard on the maintenance staff. So I don't. I don't necessarily think um, being able to use the courses in multi facets, whether it's disc golf or follow St. Andrews, the home of golf, which closes down on Sundays just to be a picnic place for the city, which I think would be awesome if we did. Uh, golf carts aren't the direction where I think we should be focusing. And so putting asphalt in these parks and grading golf carts actually slows down play and it makes it a lot harder to play and a lot harder to maintain. So that scares me. That's a lot of money where I don't necessarily think is the best way, but it, I don't know if I really answered your question. I was using those three examples as they turned into national showcases, but they were actually in a similar spot where they just had similar land pressure from uh, the city or were in really bad financial constraints from similar situations. Like we struggle with, with flooding and funding. Thank you. Further questions for the speaker? Okay. Next is Amy Scott. Can you can you can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Got a pretty bad yeah, if you're um, if you're connected on two different devices, please um, disconnect from one of them. We'll get there. The one I clicked on disappeared. Okay. You can hear me. Yes. yes, ma'am. Okay, I hung up my phone. Sorry about that. Uh, I sent in an email, I don't know if you saw it, but I'm going to go over some of the points that I made. I've lived on the east side of Madison for a long time, and I'm an avid golfer. And I'm speaking in support of keeping the Monona Golf Course open. Um, I want to make it clear that golf courses don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in a city among the city's citizens. And we on the east side are taxpayers, like the rest of the citizens of Madison. And there are a lot of golfers on the east side. And part of our quality of life is enhanced by the fact that we have a beautiful neighborhood golf course, the Monona Golf Course. 
And as taxpayers, we'd like to get our money's worth by keeping that wonderful course open. And it's largely a matter of equity. It's a fairness issue. We all want accessible and affordable golf, and we deserve that on the east side. The west side has two neighborhood golf courses, Odana and Glenway. Now, the Yahara course is way out. That is not an east side neighborhood golf course by a dangerous intersection, and it's across from a smelly dump. We want to keep Monona just like the West Side has two courses. We're asking for the one neighborhood course we have here to be saved. If you look at a map of Madison, you can see that the West Side is dominant here. And this is a very important factor in decision making. We need a balance in this city. And the way to achieve that is to save Monona Golf Course. It's a beautiful course. It's challenging, yet it is playable by newer golfers and by golfers of all skill levels and ages. And the thing about Monona that's so wonderful, it's a nine-hole course, but it's got a terrific driving range. Uh, and I myself enjoy going out there to practice. I like to go and warm up before I play. And if we're going to encourage people to take up the game of golf, they have to have a place to practice. It is totally inappropriate for someone to go out on a golf course and play as a new golfer when they don't know how to play. So it's wonderful to have a facility like Monona that's got a driving range where people can take lessons, they can learn, they can practice, and then move right over to the course and play once they've gotten to the right level. The idea that we would get rid of a course like Monona that has the best driving range in the city and that drains better than any of the other city courses and has a challenging nine-hole course seems absurd to me, in addition to being unfair. So, I think we have a terrific facility in Monona with the driving range and a challenging course. And it, it is rarely closed, uh, except, of course, in the office. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's three minutes. May I just say a final statement? And that is that the First Tee program teaches more kids at Monona Golf Course than any of the other courses, and we can't leave those kids behind. Please save Monona Golf Course, and thank you for your work on the committee. Thank you, ma'am. Questions for the speaker? Okay, thank you. Uh, so now we'll hear from Gary Peterson from 210 Marinette Trail in Madison, uh, neither supports nor opposes, but wishes to speak. Three minutes, Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank the uh, uh, committee for giving me this opportunity to speak. Golf courses in Madison, uh, I should start out by saying I'm a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, and I've been a uh, city planner my whole career, and I understand the uh, involvement of uh, the economic development and the leisure and uh, governmental aspects, educational aspects of the community. But golf courses are really a quality of life in Madison. It's it's a big deal, um, and it it shouldn't be uh, negated or looked down on. Madison wins awards because of its quality of life. And just today, it was recognized as one of the two best cities in the United States to recover from COVID-19. I mean, that's fantastic. All of our open space, which golf courses are part of, were some of the reason that we won that award. The other thing is that a 36-hole golf course is really a big deal. And there are very few of them. Uh, as soon as we lost the uh, uh, pros, the uh, state golfing association canceled their uh, tournament at uh, Yahara, but it had been uh, the home to the 36-hole 30, state tournament for a number of years. 
then to evaluate golf courses based on accounting principles, not a good idea. Um, it's not the way to evaluate open space and, and public use. The loss of professionals certainly did hurt us. It didn't earn the money that the accountants projected. Uh, it, it's just uh, put a damper on, on the thing. The other side of the coin is, and this is a big thing with the task force, did you look at increasing the income? I mean, people always cut costs. Why don't we increase income? And I think that's a key here. I mean, did you look at putting wind turbines up on the hill? Did you look at putting solar panels, uh, particularly on the south side of the Ahara? Uh, they generate income. Other people are putting in things, uh, uh, sustainable uh, energy producers like that. Why aren't we doing that in increasing our income? Um, again, I think that. Uh, a key to this is increase the income with our opportunity and don't make the pay for the golf courses be funded by accounting principles. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, questions for the speaker, anyone? Okay. Uh, next, we have Tim Casper from 5711 Winnequa Road in Monona. Mr. Casper, you have three minutes. Um, he was there and he just disappeared. Okay, well, maybe he'll call back. Uh, let's move on to Darwin Thompson from 4322 Green Avenue in Madison. Darwin, you're unmuted. Is he still there? I'm not sure he's unmuted, but I don't hear anything from him. Um, hmm. I do see Tim Casper came back in, so maybe we can mute Darwin and go back to Tim. Uh, Mr. Casper. I'm here. I, I'm sorry I lost you. Well, welcome back. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know whether you received the email that I sent on Friday, but I'm just basically going to repeat that and answer any questions. Um, I'm not sure if this meeting is designed for the purpose of a recommendation to the city by the task force, but any recommendation would seem premature given force delays due to the coronavirus policy and the lack of data available to make any meaningful recommendation. Uh, the city and parks have framed the issue with Madison Golf and Madison Parks as a financial issue. As one of the comments indicated at the March 9, 2020 meeting, the 2016 annual, annual report was the last time profitability analysis of, the, of specific courses were shared with the public. These were not audited financials. They were unaudited managerial analysis. And that commenter said, shouldn't we have audited financials before considering closing a great course like Monona? The service financial information provided by Parks is inadequate for the type of decision of this type of decision making. I did some more digging on the financials after the public comment meeting at Oldbrook a couple months ago. Initially, I was told recent data was readily available on the Parks website, and later was told it was readily available on the Task Force website. Neither was true. I had to do a lot of digging with the city to find any other financial data. Finally, Ryan Brinza helped out. He's the head golf pro, and he pointed me to some budgets which contain some data, which is not very detailed. The entity charges assessed to the golf enterprise make the expense of the golf enterprise look worse than it is. The three big entity expenses are pilot, IT, and fleet service charges. The only element of the Parks Department paying pilot is the golf enterprise. 
I've never been able to drill down into the IT and fleet service charges because I've never been given a straight answer as to what these expenses are. I believe them to be an allocation to the golf enterprise of parks or city expenses that benefit other areas of the parks department or the city and not just golf. If those, be- if those expenditures benefit the golf enterprise at all. At the end of the day, it may be the golf enterprise uh, contributes more to the city than vice versa, but given this data, who knows? The data is simply insufficient. Parks keeps indicating the golf enterprise should be run as a business, and yet is not providing the type of financial information necessary to make business decisions. Um, I've spoken with Jim Kopp of the task force and sent him a detailed inf- in, uh, email on this and other topics. And just one last thing, given the coronavirus policy of the city and the state, the city golf courses are packed right now. People who don't golf at all, all that much are getting some exercise and fresh air while engaging in natural social distancing the game entails. It might also be that the golf enterprise will add to the city's bottom line this year. Thank goodness the course closures were not done earlier, and I'm available for both questions and help if anybody wants any. Thank you, sir. Questions for the speaker? Okay. Uh, Darwin Thompson, 4322 Green Avenue. Yes. Neither wishes. uh, No, I didn't register to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have a. I don't have a microphone. Okay, thank you. My mistake. Okay, Darwin Thompson uh, registered, but you can you can mute that guy. Thank you. Um, does not wish to speak. I'm sorry. John Lasky from five seven zero six Hempstead Road neither supports nor opposes and does not wish to speak. Um, Wayne, let's see, Joe Kiesau from 1459 Chadsworth Drive in Sun Prairie. Neither supports nor opposes and doesn't wish to speak. Susie Madden from 111 North Hamilton Street in Madison. Neither supports nor opposes and does not wish to speak. Um, Patrick Schammer from... 9602 Lost Pine Trail in Verona, neither supports nor or opposes and does not wish to speak. But is sorry, there... Bill, that's under the um, next item. Oh, sorry. You know, yeah, thank you. Um, I just want right. to point out real quick the um, Darwin Thompson, John Lasky, and Alex Haskins did register neither in support nor opposition, um, but do not wish to speak, but am available to answer questions. Um, so we had, so Darwin Thompson is on the phone, and um, I think I saw it. Alex Haskins is here as well. If anyone has questions for them, any questions? Okay, so let's move on to uh, item four, which is disclosures and recusals. Anybody have any ethics issues they'd like to tell us about? Don't see any raised hand. So now we'll move on to uh, community engagement and input in item five. Are we going to get a staff report tonight on all of the data that was gathered? That's what the presentation is about, um, Bill. I have uh, okay. several slides. Yeah. Let's have it. Then. And then there, there was a written um, summary provided as well. But I can resend that. Paul, 
Am I supposed to share my screen or do you have the presentation for us to use? I do not have the presentation. Okay. Let me get this figured out. Anybody know their jokes while we're waiting? Sorry. You know, a tough crowd. I'm giving up on you. Yes. Um, if we invited the person who um, is giving the presentation, they can share their screen as well, as long as they're in the panelist. Uh, I'm the one giving the presentation, so I thought oh, I okay. sent it. <laughs> I guess I should have clarified that and how that worked last week, but I didn't. Yeah, I was just. You want to say something? You recommended, you, you requested a joke, so I had a joke for you. Please, hold so, forward. So there's two muffins in an oven. And one muffin looks at the other muffin and says, <clears throat> it's getting hot in here. And the other muffin turns and says, ah, a talking muffin. <laughs> That's all I okay. got. Okay. You want to hear the worst joke I know? What's brown and sticky? A stick. Thanks for that, you guys. I'm ready to share my screen now. Um, sorry about the delay there. Can everybody see this okay? Hello? Yes, we can see it. Thanks. Yes, it's fine. But go ahead. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Lisa Lashinger. I'm the assistant park superintendent. So tonight I'm going to give you an overview of everything that we gathered of, a, I'm sorry, a summary of the information that we gathered during the outreach process. So um, in, in the, um, we did the survey, which was released at the end of February, and we got 4,000, just under 4,100 responses. And then we held two public information meetings, uh, one at Olbrick and one at Goodman Maintenance Facility with about 150 people total in attendance. And then we also um, held a focus group. Uh, the first one, the one that we've held so far was with golfers. So we selected golfers who um, we, that, that our, our staff know uh, golf, all of the courses, um, have varying interests, we're of different ages. Uh, we had a woman and a person of color on the, the focus group. And then we had people of different ages. So we felt we had a, a wide array of, even though we had seven people, we had a wide array of people. Um, so we had facilitated questions that we went through with them. So I'll, I'll cover a little bit more on each of these as we go through it. Um, we will have a city staff focus group that we have yet to meet. We were planning to meet the first week that we actually started going through COVID-19 response. So um, that's been delayed, obviously. And then we've had a number of emails, phone calls, letters, and editorials that we've also provided. So those are all attached to the legislative file. So you can go in and see the raw uh, emails and the editorials. You can see all of the raw survey data, data as well. So in total, since the task force began, We've had 4,300 points of contact. So um, that, that's quite a few um, in a very short amount of time. 
So the survey results, the survey was open between February 28th and April 9th. So that's around 40 days. Um, it was offered, we pushed it out um, by our the golf website, through social media, we did a news release. And then we also emailed everybody that's attended the golf meetings and signed up on an email list to ask for the updates. And then we also um, sent it out to our parks contact list as well. So people that had participated in the park and open space plan work. So of the 4,100, just under 4,100 responses for the survey, about 88% of those people had golfed in Madison and then 12% were non-golfers. So we did get a pretty good survey of what uh, the courses are used for when not used for golfing. Um, and then data analysis does include all responses, a comparison by the preferred courses, as well as um, the information for golfers versus non-golfers. And then, as I mentioned, uh, you have access to the raw data, and we sent that to the task force members last week. So a uh, breakdown by zip code, 85%, um, just under 85% of the responses were from people that live in the Madison area with Madison zip codes. So this, uh, one of the questions was, what's your zip code? Uh, we had people from as far west as, Indi as Idaho and California, as well as some people in uh, Florida and Illinois. But the vast majority of our responses were from Madison. So um, how often do people typically golf at the course? <clears throat> we, um, again, all of this, infer the raw data is available, but it seems like um, the people that, that had golf tended to golf 10 or more times a year. So that was where the majority of our people were. Um, and then you could see, we could tell from course to course what their responses were. So we could tell that, Glenway golfers golfed fewer times. So that indicated that that's generally the definitely the more recreational golfers, the people who go out once and try it or because it's a, a, a smaller course and it's more friendly for those new golfers. And then in the past five years, have you golfed at any of the have you golfed at any of the following? Um, so Odana is used the most. Of course, we kind of knew that going into this based on the numbers. And then Glenway is golf the least. Um, but it was pretty equally distributed. The people that had responded to the survey, which courses they golfed at. Um, and of the 30, of over 3,500, only 11% only golfed at one course. So that's pretty telling um, because we'll often hear from people that are more passionate about one course than the other. Um, and then users who prefer Glenway are least likely to golf at Yahara and vice versa. And again, we believe that's because of the, the difference in the courses. But um, the, a major comparison was between Odana and Yahara, which are very similar courses, both 18 hole courses. They, um, there wasn't any, there might be preference, but both golfers tended to play both courses. So um, as far as, I'm sorry, I can, can't see my full screen because I've got the, um, let me see, I can do this. Um, sorry, I'm learning this as I go, <laughs> the, the Zoom thing. Um, Paul, is there a way for me to move this? Oh, here we go. I figured it out. Um, People who prefer Odana and Yahara tend to golf 18 holes, obviously because they're the longer courses. And then the nine hole uh, golfers pre preferred Monona and Glenway. So uh, when we ask the question if how many if they if the golfers or non golfers felt if there were the right number of holes, uh, if 72 holes was the right number. 71 to 75 percent of the golfers um, felt that there were the right number of holes. Um, golfers largely supported maintaining the same number of holes. And then they indicate that if closure is necessary, closing only 18 at Yahara is the most acceptable. So one of the um, questions, one of the very last questions, 
did provide people an opportunity to fill in feedback or fill in where they couldn't, they didn't feel they were able to answer the survey as, as much as they would like. So that's where we pulled some of that information from. So what we learned from the golf sur golfer surveys was that course conditions and tee times, as well as pace of play and cost and location were the most important um, for them. Those were the top five. And then um, as far as location, Glenway users were the ones that felt location was most important. So when we surveyed the non-golfers, about 55% of them, I'm sorry, about 50% of them had used the courses for any other purpose than golf. And Odana was the most used, primarily because it is open year round. Uh, it, we have the cross country skiing there and the, the ski trails are groomed more frequently than at Yahara. Um, it's just had a longer presence. And then all other uses were equally used for non-golfing purposes. Um, about 25% of golfers had used the courses for, for other purposes. So about of the, the non-golfers that responded, 25% of them hadn't actually used the course from what we could tell from the data. But then um, in some of the written comments, you'll see that some people included the driving ranges and the putting greens. In, the, in their response for non-golf purposes. So um, there was a little uncertainty in that information. Um, and then as far as demographics, while the vast majority of um, respondents were over the, were white males over the age of 50, we did have women and people, people of color represented as well. Um, and then we also, uh, it seemed that the household income was equally distributed among the three upper categories. Um, so I believe that was from, you have the raw data in front of you. I don't have the number right here with me. Um, or not in front of you, but you have it available to you. So it, it seemed like it was evenly dispersed in the upper category. So I believe it was from 40,000 and above per household. And then users who preferred Od Yahara and Odana tended to be young. So our public information meetings, um, again, we held two of them with about uh, 150 people in attendance. At, for both of them, we started the meeting with a brief overview, about 15 to 20 minutes of what the work that the task force has done so far. So that's all of the information we had covered in previous meetings, as well as um, we presented the options, the possible scenarios that the task force had, had spoke about at the last meeting. So I've, we've included here the major takeaways from the public information meetings. I won't read all of them, but generally there were questions about the accounting system. There were uh, concerns that uh, the courses perhaps weren't managed properly, particularly since the pros um, were let go. Um, but there was really no major consensus. There was just some but some people definitely voiced concern about that. Um, and then many felt that golf shouldn't be um, accounted for as an enterprise, that it should be included in the park system uh, and a, a fee charged appropriately. Um, but many at the Ulbrich meeting felt uh, that Monona should be saved and not closed. And there was definitely concern about affordability and accessibility for both the youth and the seniors. Because uh, as we've heard, uh, Monona is a very uh, one of the major locations for the first key. So moving on to the second um, public information meeting, which was held at Goodman Maintenance Facility, many of the same questions and comments that came from the Ulbrich ones. Um, at this particular meeting, there seemed to be more uh, requests and consideration for an 18-hole closure at Yahara than in the, the Ulbrick meeting. Um, and then there also was more suggestions that we improve marketing and look for other opportunities for non-golfing and golfing purposes. 
So just again, I'll, I'll let you read through that on when we get it sent over to you. And then as I mentioned earlier, we did one focus group of golfers um, seven people, and I, I give a quick um, summary of the, the people that we had included on that. Um, but we did have a facilitated conversation with them. One of the first questions we asked them was, what do you think about when you think about the Madison golf courses? And nearly all of them had mentioned, I, I get my exercise, I can keep active, I can socialize with my friends. But a lot of them also mentioned that they started golf as a at a young age, and they had many memories for themselves as well as with their family growing up through the golf game. And then we asked them uh, what the overall strengths of the golf enterprise program was, and they um, talked to, they talked about the professional staff, uh, felt that staff is responsive and always follow up in a timely manner, whether it's for a league or a, a tournament. Um, and then location of courses, they really like the layout of the courses are, as they are right now, especially for high school students, um, being able to get to them very easily. And then um, they also felt the ability to serve the youth and have tea times for other players was very important because of the size of our program, we're able to accommodate that. And then what do you consider to be Madison? We asked them what they considered to be the overall limitations of the program. Um, again, the, the accounting system, the enterprise came up. Um, we heard on limitations in food and beverage, which we had heard at um, some of the public information meetings. And then we also heard of um, lack of capital investment resulting in inconsistency due to the weather conditions. So Yahara was a big one. Uh, they want to be able to book a tea time at Yahara and know they're going to be able to play, but they know that they can't right now give it the course condition. And then we asked among the scenarios uh, which they felt most compelled to, which they felt most compelling and why. Um, none of them seemed to, uh, they, they didn't really support any of the closures, um, but they did feel that with the information presented that the, the courses should be treated as a park service. Um, they did feel that an option was missing to close only 18 at Yahara and nothing else. And then uh, if they had to choose between the, the four options that were presented, they thought number three might be most acceptable, but not ideal. Um, but they do have concerns that one and two would change the marketplace and make it less accessible for again, seniors and youth. So um, among the scenarios presented, they felt the least compelling was a full closure of Yahara and any closure of Monona or Glenway. So they definitely feel that um, that closure would impact the youth, the Yahara closure would impact the youth because of reducing overall holes available. Hmm. So um, some things that they felt should be considered um, that maybe haven't been discussed was more marketing, more professional marketing and cost containment measures, um, management by a third party, um, and then creative solutions, anything ranging from a nine to 14 hole course is what we had seen throughout the engagement process. And then considering capital investment at Yahara by working with the hydrology, making a dry course and considering a walking only course. And then they also uh, had mentioned with the focus group considering a larger, a shorter executive course at Yahara. And then overall summary, we heard a lot of the same things throughout, whether it was through the survey, the public information meeting, or um, the focus group. And we here we tried to pull it all together. Accessibility and affordability are key concerns. Impacts of decisions need to be evaluated in particular who is going to be most hurt if there are closures. Um, and then the overwhelming majority felt the enterprise system needed to go away. Um, and then capital investment by the city to some degree is essential. No real support or sale of parkland. There was no real support of, for the sale of parkland among golfers or non-golfers. 
Um, those that did support any sort of closure was for the purpose of reinvesting in the golf program. Uh, and then while the majority of golfers supported any sort of full closures, there seemed to be more support um, by re in reducing Yahara by 18 and reconfiguring the course possibly. And then a number of people felt that um, considering different operational models was necessary along with that diversified marketing and offering of services. So again, all of this information is available in the legislative file. I, We'll get, the, we'll get this presentation attached to it also, but this is really just a summary. You can see for yourselves what um, how people responded. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, questions for uh, staff? Just raise your hand and I'll call on you in the order that you click the button. Uh, just so everybody knows, if you're still in full screen, you have to click exit full screen at the upper right in order to see the raise hand function again. Uh, Excuse me. Chandra, you have a question? I do. And I'm sure that this was something that was um, provided to us earlier. I just can't lay my hands on it. But where is the report from the Park Service about the capacity and the number? I, I know we've had it from the number of holes played at each golf course, but I don't know if I've seen it over the total, like which, which courses are at full capacity and how much when they're during the course season. Is that someplace in one of the reports? that um, somebody can point me to? If we have the full capacity, if we've shared the full capacity at each of the courts, so if we were sold every single tea time available? Yep. I don't know if we provided that, but we can certainly get that. Okay. More questions for Lisa? Okay. Well, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, appreciate that You're welcome. summary. So now we're on to item six on our agenda, which is task force deliberation, discussion, and possible recommendation. So now at this point, we have seen a lot of data gathered by the staff, and we've toured all the courses. We've had a fairly robust public. Uh, engagement process with focus groups and a survey, heavily promoted survey, and a couple of big public meetings. Uh, is there anything else that you all can think of that we might need? And I would also like to point out that the world has changed since we last met. Um, if anything, it's it's uh, well, it's weirder than anything I ever thought I'd live to see, but. But I think that the I think we'd all agree now that the fiscal challenges for the city uh, are much greater than they were uh, in fair the magnitude of that at this point. But uh, I think it's really from my perspective, it looks like it might have narrowed our options quite a bit. Oh, just a reminder too, we do have a few registrants for item six. Thank you kindly. Let's go over there and figure out who that is. Bill, there are a couple hands raised also. All right, thank you. Let me just read the registrants first uh, for item six. Patrick Schaumer from 9602 Lost Pine Trail in Verona, Wisconsin, neither supports nor opposes. But and does not wish to speak, but is available to answer questions. Uh, Tyler Brown. From 1827 East Washington Street, apartment, no, Madison, Wisconsin, neither of 
the Port Center opposes, does not wish to speak, but is available to answer questions. Patrick Blake from 3887 Garfoot Road in Mount Horeb, Wisconsin, supports, uh, does not wish to speak, but is available to answer questions. Megan Handley from uh, ha uh, 5118 Hammersley Road in Madison, Wisconsin, neither supports nor opposes, does not wish to speak. Um, and Joe Kiesau from 1459 Chadsworth Drive in Sun Prairie, neither supports nor opposes, does not wish to speak. And Jean Bassinius uh, from 35 Petway Ferguson opposes and does not wish to speak. Okay, hands up. James Cop. I'm curious now that we've heard a lot of information from the people that use the courses and live in the Madison area. What has city staff done thus far to explore other options rather than closing any courses? We've recently seen that the project um, at the corner of 12 and 18 and 90 uh, is going to be moving forward. And they're talking about a huge sports complex. In, that involves state of Wisconsin, Dane County, um, city of Madison. What could we benefit and take away from that project that would enable some drainage improvements, course improvements to Yahara? And I, I know it's a ways off, but have we considered it and explored it? So I'm, I'm curious as to what has the city done so far? We, we, we know that they've been in contact with people to do some potential leasing, but there's restrictions to it. We know that there's been some communication with regards to the sale of uh, Monona uh, that never came to fruition. But before we can really say, all right, here's a decision, I'd like to know, in detail what's been done so far. Okay, Eric uh, has his hand up. So Mr. Knapp, would you like to answer the question? Uh, certainly I can give it a try. Okay. So I'd actually start by just recognizing the challenges that we're all facing here, even virtually. Uh, on this important matter and the extreme pause button we went through, uh, you all went through in your lives. And I think the, the first thing I want to hear you, the staff, and those who the, this meeting tonight is going back up and trying to make sure we're getting uh, the community engagement stuff to you, and then also trying to hear what more we can provide. So, um, and, and so I'll get to Jim's question in a second. I just want to walk through things we've done recently in preparation for getting back up and running with the task force is um, we, we have a um, substantially uh, fleshed out draft report that we will uh, share with task force members soon and then post publicly that doesn't have recommendations and that will be very clear. It's the, the background that some of everything we presented that kind of lays it out. So what we've done with the task force. Uh, as far as solutions and options, and Jim brought up, I think um, the challenge for us is there's a number of avenues we can go uh, as a city, but I think exploring all of them to an extent is viable or you know has has merit. You know. um, so, uh, and, and I, I just want to also say that the um, the sale of an any land has not been contemplated in the meaningful. It's certainly been talked about, and I know we get, we get a lot of focus because it was talked about openly for years, or it was discussed, but it was never anything close to an actual sale. I want to be clear about that for folks. But 
Uh, we have reached out to partners. Uh, one of the groups that at the next meeting I expect you to hear from uh, would actually be, and Noah uh, could talk a little bit about how it is. But the first team we've been connected with their new executive director and trying to come up with some ideas of how to invigorate and, and, and protect the football. Uh, we've been in conversations over the last two years, especially the last six, seven months, uh, with the we were, we were mayor, so relatively about uh, her stance and perspective on the enterprise accounting component, which obviously we heard a lot about in engagement. Eric, I'm having a real hot tariff time hearing you at all. Everything is yeah. Why don't you really turn hard. your video off, Eric. You don't have you don't have the bandwidth to do but mm -hmm. it sounds like it's coming from a different microphone. Off. If you um Click the little up arrow by your mute. You can select. Uh, there's a thing that says select a microphone. Um, you may be selected on the wrong thing. Make sure um, whatever your headset brand name is or whatever you'll see under there and select that. Under the... Uh, well, Noah, you had your hand up. Let's let's hear from you. What you got? Um, well, I just uh, was wondering, um, what is this uh, project, Jim, that you were talking about that the city and state are uh, doing? I've, I, this is the first time I've heard about it. Something I'm open. Yeah, just it's been proposed for about three years now, Noah. It it okay. was just recently resurrected but it's a huge sports complex with the redesign of the highway where that intersection is out on the Southeast side. And the one that was in the paper the other day, they're actually discussing moving the entrance that is on Mill Pond right now up to highway AB, which I support for safety. Um, it, 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 and with all that construction, now you've got material that could be used to create different water diversions. And we have a, an opportunity to make a huge improvement there that would not be costing the city of Madison taxpayers, but could be shared with the state, county, and city. Okay, thank you. And I think if you, you might Google it and look it up and you get some pretty good details as to a draft of it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Is Eric back? Uh, I'm going to say one more comment while he's trying to get on is we've listened to a lot of the commentary of people that are not necessarily city of Madison residents. Um, we've had Monona, Mount Horeb, Verona, all over. Have we considered approaching the county to take over the operations of the golf courses? I mean, it's something that's not been considered that I know of, but it wouldn't hurt. Okay, Eric, I unmuted you. Uh, and, um, and this is, uh, I, I dropped the headset. Can you hear me better? Yes. Better, much better. Okay, great. And I'm going to stay looking right at it. This is after the Park Commission debacle, Paul. I tried to pull a headset out. Now, we'll figure out the tech later. So. I apologize, I won't repeat myself. So for everybody uh, who heard it, and I appreciate my, the one thing I will say, that I appreciate all your uh, patience in this exploration together in the virtual meetings on an important issue. Staff does not have a uh, perspective. Uh, meeting tonight from our perspective is to get back up, see all your friendly faces, hear public engagement comment based on the engagement that we've collected and, and start uh, finding this path forward to the next few meetings. Um, and hear what we, we don't have. 
I just want to jump off a couple things that I, I did say that I want to repeat. We've, we've never been close to selling any parkland. Uh, there's never been a deal with the developer behind the scenes. It's been talked about in specific locations. Uh, it's specifically been known at one point. That's an idea I won't uh, make uh, anybody uh, defend or say where it started, but it's been around for a long time as a concept. Uh, I do want to jump off that. Uh, I'm not sure, Jim, and we can talk about it. Uh, the resurrection of the sports complex is, is somewhat news to me. We, in partnership, Noah, and for the task force, we, in partnership with the Ho-Chunk Nation, a few years ago, did a feasibility study on a sports complex that would uh, be located uh, between or in conjunction with the Ho-Chunk, the nation land, and our, and our land, not on the golf course at the time, was the focus. Uh, that feasibility study came back in a manner that uh, both we and they decided not to move forward at that time. Now, the interchange is moving forward, which is an exciting thing. And that is tied to the Ho-Chunk Nation's master plan efforts, which is to expand uh, their facilities for a larger hotel uh, interconnected with uh, the casino property itself and some level of convention meeting space and, and restaurants and kind of a walkability or entertainment district, I think is the term. And that master plan has been approved by the city contingent on uh, safe uh, transportation access into the site. And we at the uh, Parks Division, are very supportive of the planned realignment of the 1218 uh, interchange. Uh, we think it serves Yahara Hills well, and frankly, it serves our residents well by taking two of our uh, most dangerous intersections in the city uh, where multiple accidents every year happen. Unfortunately, a number of deaths have happened in the last decade and kind of takes them into a situation with a, a method of great separation that should, should enhance safety and long-term enhanced biking and pedestrian access to the north as well. Um, but so that, that project is moving forward. I do want to give a time frame. People can understand what that time frame looks like. That, um, that interchange is unlikely to be constructed anytime before, I'll say 2026 is my, my guess. At this point, that would be relatively quick. Um, maybe a little earlier if uh, some of the federal dollars fall just right. Uh, but there's a lot of questions from the COVID-19 uh, at all levels of government, what funding streams are going to look like. So uh, I would I would not count on it before that period. In fact, I think there's a real argument that it could fall down that lane a little bit. Um, but and even if it does happen, and it will, I think, help uh, uh, drainage in the area, because quite frankly, a new highway project with interchange will inherently be required to meet stormwater regulations and standards today uh, compared to when it was built, right? So, but that stormwater control, the biggest potential benefit to Yohar would be if it intercedes any stormwater flowing from the north specifically. I don't think anything flowing from the east is going to be uh, uh, substantially changed, uh, but um, that northeastern direction, as Jim knows, is a regular out there. As all people at Yohar know, that northeastern corner is the where a lot of water does come from. It could very much help, uh, but the timing is not uh, soon. Uh, for sure. It can't be counted can't be counted on to be soon. Other things, so where we, we've talked to, what have we been doing? Um, I've, we've got some good draft RFP, right? For uh, contracting out, uh, and now not draft RFPs in our uh, documents, sir, that we've assembled some of the RFPs from around the, the country where people have looked at contracting out, like we talked about models earlier on, uh, you know, our, us run everything, us run none of it, um, you know, leases, there's different kind of models. And so we've gotten some of those. If the, if this task force wanted to pursue looking further at recommending, evaluating, doing an RFP for a model or management change, we would be prepared to work with the, the council or what have you to, to, to draft them. Right? So that's a piece of work that's been done that doesn't really see the light of day because we can share five or 10 RFPs around the country, but they're actually pretty boring. And they're basically just, what do you want to ask for? And that'd be a recommendation. I know some members of this body have brought up as an area of thought of recommending or at least contemplating. Uh, so we've done some work there. Uh, that's model change. As far as fiscal, fiscal policy change, we've discussed with uh, the mayor to an extent, her, her take and perspective on the enterprise fund. Former Mayor Sogman was adamant that it should stay an enterprise. Uh, new Mayor Rhodes-Conway, a newer mayor, uh, over a year in now, 
uh, has been less adamant and wanted to explore op options and opportunities. That said, as I've said many times, uh, I think, but uh, it is, it, I recognize that the enterprise fund is not as well, is mostly despised by golfers. And I understand that and appreciate that. Uh, I also would point out that any change from enterprise status without um, some kind of structural change to the actual ins and outs uh, within uh, the city does not solve the city's financial issues. It, it may solve golf, but not cities. Uh, because the cost, like depreciation is an example, one of the things that enterprise have. If you don't account for depreciation on the golf books, then you're accounting for them on the general fund. So given where we're at today, I can't say where the mayor sits today on the issue, but certainly we've explored that and work with finance, I can tell you that the finance, uh, finance department has serious concerns about discussions about not making it a, an enterprise because of those implications. Um, we've also looked at um, opportunities to partner on the capital improvements that are necessary in the courses. I can tell you that I think there's a real, real reasonable chance, maybe I'll, I'll say this, I think there's a likelihood that we can have a partnership with our, our friends in stormwater engineering with the city to address uh, stormwater and drainage issues to an extent, at least, uh, in a partnership model at Odana. Uh, I think that is highly likely given the Wing Girl watershed study that has been completed and is now being shared. Uh, and Odana sits in a place where it could be of extreme importance for, frankly, my excitement on that one is helping protect people's homes and property and public health and safety, but frankly, also helping the Wing Girl watershed if we do it right. Uh, by uh, making sure that that kind of storage and it comes infiltration, right, which ties into we've done a little bit more exploring on the idea of uh, where we're at today with what the well permitting process would look like at Odana to, to get off of city water, which is clearly, I think, from the number of you have indicated uh, kind of a bane in the both of, both of the wallet, but also in sustainability. Uh, other things we have looked at, looking down this list here, um, We've worked with, and I've had a, a few conversations with leaders in the golf uh, area, in the golf um, world, I guess you would say, um, locally here, and tried to get some ideas from them of things they they, they think are warranted. Uh, the earlier speaker who referenced an update, certainly, I think uh, Glenwin Monona specifically, both, uh, you know, if we're operating those courses, uh, deserve to be thoughtfully touched up over the next decade or so. I mean, I can't say it's tomorrow uh, and in a way that would both make golf better, but frankly, try to tilt towards community use. Um, and how do you do that? It's not easy. Those are small, tight, compact courses, but I think the speaker also referenced the St. Andrews model. Uh, I'm super aware of that model. I'm so very close to working with the staff team to try to pull something Together for at least a Glenway or Monona on a Sunday afternoons this year, just operationally see what happens. Um, and then we have also worked. Um, one of the one of the criticisms and fair, it, it, it's totally fair, uh, or at least partially fair, is um, the concerns about not having enough financial data. So we have information that my intent was to share with you at the next meeting that kind of walks through the last five years. Um, uh, of data, 20, well, 2015, 2016, 17, 18, 19, four, last four full years in a kind of a line item uh, or detailed level if folks would like that. Uh, I certainly will write a summary and include that in the report. I don't want to uh, take a ton of time here. I do want to make sure to reference that all of the golf, all golf enterprise expenses are audited. Um, they are audited by our external auditors, uh, Baker Tilly. And Baker Tilly's audit is extends to the fund. It, the reason the, the when we talk about P and L statements for individual courses, the reason those are not audited is the golf fund itself is the, the that's the level of audit for the fund. Within the fund, we count for it most mostly pretty accurately, I think, by course. But it's not a, that's not a level of management audit that is paid for. Frankly, paying for that would uh, triple the audit cost from what is that? But uh, I'm not sure if I got to mo all your questions, Jim. I'm sure are all you wanted to hear from what we've been doing, but that's a general overview. I'm looking here. Um, and, and as I mentioned at the beginning, when I was a bad mic, we have met with the first tee. I'm meeting again with the first tee. My thought is they would likely uh, be a 
partner present, presenter at the next meeting is my hope. If uh, if if Ashlyn is uh, working or if Ashlyn is watching, she she can know that here. I guess the first time that we definitely, but we've been talking about that idea and how to partner with them to support youth golf, how to support accessible golf, inclusionary golf. And, you know, their focus on equity is notable and very much appreciated. So that's kind of a not quick but update and. We're here to, uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer a follow-up if you want to target me better. Eric, uh, I think you were working on your technology when I raised one more question. Um, there's been, there was lots and lots of comments at the, uh, listening sessions about the drainage issues and the water caused by the landfill. And I said, is there any possibility of partnering with the county to maybe take over the operations of golfing? A lot of the folks that responded were not city of Madison residents. So could this be a big picture um, solution? or potential solution or an option is probably a better term. Yeah, I, I can, I can certainly ask the mayor's office uh, to ask again. Uh, the current mayor is, uh, has a really pretty good relationship with Joe Parisi. I can tell you from a staff level uh, over the years, there's been no interest from Dane County land and watershed or parks in operating golf courses. They don't, they don't offer, um, they offer many things, including a few, disc golf courses, but they don't offer um, many of the services that a lot of services we offer like that are very intense to operate and very revenue generation oriented. Um, they, they are not in that business. They have expressed no interest in being in it from a staff level. Prior, I know when this topic was broached with former Mayor Sagan, which is over a year ago, uh, he did have some conversation with the county and there was very little interest. I think the county's um, response at that time had that its support of golf was in, in leasing land that it, it owned. Uh, which I, is, yeah. Which I is just the think that it, it's been a successful type operation in other parts of Wisconsin where the county partners with the city, um, mm -hmm. knowing that the constituents of the whole county are playing on those courses. No, certainly. I mean, there's there's no doubt that we, we the survey data shows that we have a significant number of residents of Madison who play our courses. That's a predominant number. I want to be clear, but certainly a significant number of neighboring municipalities absolutely use our courses, and I think that's a um, a foundational um, question from a policy perspective of operating as an enterprise or not, because a subsidy to golf, um, a subsidy to anything. I know people can use all of our parks, but that's been philosophically a concern from some policymakers over the years. I'm not opining on it. I'm just saying, frankly, I think that's been one of the concerns is there's no tax support from the other municipalities from which uh, customers come. So that's one of the arguments for it. So uh, Eric, remind me again, how many golf courses are in Dane County? The 32? Oh, a lot. Let me <laughs> to get my list, but um, quite a few now. Of no municipal golf courses, Middleton and um, not Horb, Mr. Brenza is if Brent, Mr. Brenza or Mr. Steindl on the line can probably answer that better than me, but there are not very many municipal golf courses in Dane County. And that's going back to when we talked about the growth and explosion in rate of golf holes in the, you know, the, 80s, 90s, when you go back to that presentation, those are almost all daily fee, private owned, right? Privately owned, mostly privately owned lane too. The privately owned courses that appeal to the daily fee player, they're not country club. And they are essentially in direct, um, maybe not competition, but definitely in the same segment of the market as municipal golf courses would be. So, um, Wanaki didn't need to build a Municipal golf course, Six Mile Creek happened, right? And and so that's um, it's notable. I think that we have as many holes as we have, and as few that are municipally controlled. Uh, 
Okay. Other comments from the from the commission. Ms. Kruger. He is unmuted, but we just don't hear. Sorry, my bad. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I just want to give some support for the idea of, uh, that was mentioned already, but just multi use golf courses where the public has access to them at times for non-golf purposes. I live right next to Monona golf course. If I were to open these sh blinds, you would see the golf course. And uh, during shelter at home, it was so obvious to me how, uh, how many people use the golf course for non golfing purposes, you know, for just playing and walking and kite flying and walking their dogs. I mean, that's no surprise. But I, I, I do see a lot of potential there. And it, I felt like because it was close to golf, people took more liberties than they would have normally. Um, but I think to support Eric's idea that he mentioned earlier, if we open it, make rules around it and let the public know it's a shared resource, I think there's some real potential there as well. So um, I know we've talked about it already, but I just want to voice my support because I've been thinking a lot about it as I watch, you know, people traffic through the park or through the golf course daily. Uh, you know, it's been interesting to me. I think a lot of people come at this thinking that if we close Monona or any of the other courses, we're going to sell them to fund the requisite infrastructure uh, investments that are needed at the other ones. It would be interesting if we could go back in time to just take that land sale off the table and then see what the uh, public perspective was on you know if, if you think okay if you sell it if it's not a golf course that means it's going to be a development right versus it's not going to be a golf course but it's still going to be public open space that's a really different a really different thing i think too for the, the other thing i'm thinking about is just that i'm sure glenway uh being a neighborhood golf course is much like monona it, it's hard to see the same sort of um like I don't know if impromptu, but non-golf use from the neighborhood at Yahara. Like I just imagine it's not a destination you're going to drive to, to walk your dog when golf goes. I can't, maybe, but I, it doesn't strike me as that. Whereas Eric can maybe attest to, the, to whether or not that's false or true, but uh, just, uh, and a public commenter said this too, but having a neighborhood golf course that you can access by foot uh, is really great for golfers, but it, it's you know just as great for the public too. If if there is some sort of structure around shared use, which um, I I just wanted to voice my support. Really like this idea that the famous old Scottish course is closed on Sundays, and you can come over there and have a picnic. Mm -hmm. Can't have a picnic in the arboretum, but you could have one at one of the <laughs> golf courses, maybe. <laughs> Um, other comments? Otter Hennick. This unmute button doesn't work well. I'm trying to unmute the alder and I can't do it. Does that work? No, you do uh, it. Give me, okay. So he I just has wanna... more power than me. <laughs> If, yeah, if anyone mutes themselves, then um, when you unmute them, they get a prompt and they have to like confirm that they want to be unmuted. Um, so in our last finance committee at the at the city, we had a you know overview of the first quarter's financials, and we had one line item in there. You know, we had red on all the the um, deficits that we have and the, the the bad things, and one of those was nine hundred thousand negative for municipal golf courses. And so I wanted to kind of ask Eric Nepp to break that down a little bit for us on, on is that what portion of that is um, the actual operating expenses and what portion of that is capital? Because from the presentations that we've seen so far, um, it looks very much like the golf courses on an operating basis, whether we close one or all five of them, it's very similar. 
It's within $100,000 of them throughout the year. The big problem that we face is within with capital improvement. And so I kind of wanted to get from Eric what, what the breakout of that 900,000 number is. Um, and because that was, that was very impactful for Alder sitting in on that meeting um, to see. Certainly. Um, and so first, the, the only operational budget concerns and, and the 900 is, is all, well, 90, 85% uh, operational nature. And so I think when we talk about kind of puttering along or kind of holding our own operationally, mostly other than the bleeding year of 2018, which I'll get to in a second, um, mostly on a cash basis, so not including depreciation or uh, outstanding pension liabilities, those things are not cash oriented, mostly on a cash basis over the, the last five years, we've been cash even. From an operating P&L statement, if you incorporate the all the costs associated with the golf enterprise, which include those depreciation uh, type items, as well as central, ser central service charges that have been discussed, those type of things, golf has been, uh, it's a comprehensive net income approach, operation, you know, it's operationally, still. it's comprehensive, but since we're not spending anything in capital or anything of note uh, and haven't for de over a decade, it really is operational. So in 2015, we made, it, we made 50,000 on comprehensive net income. 2016, it was a, a negative 393. Um, 2017, it was negative 372. 2018, which is what, led us here, I think, as a inflection point, was a, a negative 863,000. And then in 2019, last year, was about, it was right at negative uh, 536. And so when we talk about a $900,000 loss this year is the estimated loss. Just to, we didn't open till two weeks ago, and we're still on track to have about the same year as we did in 2018. It was that bad. So. Like we, we did the, the $900,000 estimate at this point, assume that opening, assume we have some still dialed up opening. Uh, I can tell you we have done, um, just going through the emails here, I'm trying to find the one from this morning. We have done fairly well. We've done fairly well in rounds considering we just opened and for oh, an aggregate across the golf program from this year to compared to last year in 2019. Uh, we're down about 2,800 rounds, which is we've done 13,500 thus far. Uh, considering we opened so late, that's pretty good. Uh, and we are down about $93,000 in revenue year over year. Um, so we're actually up right now this year compared to last year at Yohara already. Now we just had two and a half inches of rain. So I think that's probably going to set us back a little bit. Uh, but overall, the outlook for this year is still worse than last year. We lost those some premium rounds of golf. We're still, we talk about being down in revenue. It's almost all uh, down in food and beverage and cart uh, and, and membership fees. Our greens fees are floating close. Like I said, we're off a little on rounds, but we're also all in summer rate rounds. So it's not been, we didn't have any spring rate, but pretty low. So financially and operationally, we say negative 900, it, that is on par with the 2018 year and it is driven almost exclusively by revenue loss. We have cut expenses dramatically. Uh, Theron could wait, Theron or Ryan would be the best, say the numbers of staff. But as of right now, with the city's overarching hiring freeze, we have stopped bringing staff on at golf. We are well below our standard number. So our expenditure profile, I, I'm confident, will be uh, less than it was last year uh, within golf. And just as a, a, you know, to tie that in, I don't want to overanalyze this, but in 2015, our expenses uh, at or 20, in 2016, our expenses were greater at all four courses than they were last year. So in the time of inflationary pressures, when we talk about water costs, we've done a lot of cost uh, containment, and that method uh, I don't think has a lot, of, a lot left to it. But I kind of got off the rails there. But the 900 
is an operational loss, and that would stack on top of the debt we already have in the general fund, which um, at this point would be a policymaker choice because we are exhausted. As of right now, we have exhausted our line of credit for $1.5 million, the general fund. Um, and so at some point in the next three to six months, we as a city are going to have to collect and decide how we want to address it. And that is real cash deficit. Okay. Chandra has a comment. Yeah, I had two comments. One was, um, is it possible for you to provide us with a straw man comparison of, I feel as though I have a good sense of how the golf courses are run and the expenses that are related to running a golf course. But is it possible for you to um, give us a comparison about how that operates on from a park's perspective? Um, so like, so we can compare a golf versus a park um, with respect to how much in the infrastructure and how, how much that gets set. That was my first question. Um, and the second question was, is I wonder, you know, as we we're looking at some of the public comments from the golfers and the non-golfers, one of the comments that came up quite a bit was creative marketing. And I think perhaps maybe, you know, even just thinking about some recommendations about rebranding the golf courses to be parks and golf courses. Um, and so it's not as though there's a one primary user over another. And just thinking a little bit about how we break down the golf versus non-golf, the golf versus community divide. Um, and combine that with the combinations that we're hearing about some creative marketing. And, and just to quickly respond to the creative marketing, uh, we, we've heard that for a, quite a while. I don't disagree. I think our brands are, are not, but not horrible. I think, frankly, Yahar Hills is a bad brand at this point. I mean, it's got a negative connotation in the golfing world. Uh, for sure, it's it's seen negatively. The problem uh, we've had with investing in those things is marketing plans do cost money if you want them done and new brands, even if not a ton. And the biggest challenge for us, just like a Yahara, of rebranding to what? You know, and what are we branding ourselves as when our bunkers are failing and we know that? Our course is not draining and we know that. And we don't have any of the amenities that people would like who aren't golfers at Yahara to bring them there. And um, and then like a Glenway and Monona and Odana, but Glenway and Monona specifically, I want to be very clear. I am a huge proponent of the community use concept. I think one of the reasons, one of the reasons, perhaps the most primary reason we are here today is the golf versus non-golf. That is real. It is so palpable. It's unbelievable to me. Um, as somebody who I, I really appreciate our golfers. I appreciate how much they enjoy recreating. I, I heard it loud and clear when we weren't able to open for it, as well as the folks who you know enjoy parks and don't like golf. And it's really, I've said it in other meetings, this group, it is unhealthy. The, the dissonance and the disagreement there in the discord. Um, and, and I understand, I think, a lot of why those things get said, but I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a, I do think it's a yes and. Now, it's a tough, it's tough to get yes and with 72 holes and asking a city to fund capital needs and stack very, very high in a time when I anticipate my capital request uh, for next year to be lower than the plan. Uh, and I think that's the only way I can be a responsible manager in the, in the, all out from the pandemic. I don't believe we can invest to the level we had planned in parks even here. Um, they, they're, you know, we, we're actively talking about, you know, as many people are, I don't want to make the city out to be special, right? We're not. We're actually very insulated in many ways, but we're still talking about staffing levels. Uh, in our park system, we have an open restroom yet. We can, but we haven't because we don't have the seasonal staff. Uh, you know, we're about 70% of our staffing normal. Uh, and we're trying to kind of hold, we're trying to open tennis tomorrow, which I think we'll get uh, at someplace. But, um, but, you know, I don't know, I don't know the exact pattern for it, but I do think there's inherently policy choice there. And I like the idea of community use. Tie that back to the rebranding, rebranding the community use or closing Glenway. That's where uh, 
I'll tease it this group. I'm really close to closing Glenway for um, golf tea times after like 2 p.m. on Sundays, starting in June or after July 4th, right? Just to see what happens. But understand right now I'm an enterprise and I'm pretty certain our finance director would have a different opinion of the validity of that at this time because our mission is to make money and the park use is not going to make uh, and we know that, but you know, we're trying to find a hybrid way out of that. But so the rebranding is certainly where it warrants. It's certainly correct, Chandra, as far as it needs to happen. Uh, but the question is to rebrand to what? Um, and then on the comparing golf to parks, I just want to make sure I understand that question. You're saying on uh, like the, the the park's budget, like operationally, what do we spend money on? Or are you saying capital? How do we inform the capital decision making process? I just want to make sure I get that one like an answer. Um, yes, now I'm unmuted. I was just trying to look for um, a, a metric that is, you know, what does the city of Madison invest in for dollars dollars per acre of a park versus dollars per acre of a golf course or, you know, public money invested on a user basis, just to kind of get a little bit of an apples and oranges in comparison as we're looking at these models. I think that that would be useful. What we have right now is just the amount of money made, lost, or invested on the golf course side. But I don't feel as though I have a good picture of what it is on the park side. Gotcha. So, see, so you're saying user user revenue, um, user counts are notoriously difficult in parks. Uh, you weren't even asking that. But user revenue uh, operating in kind of per acre. And the, one of the challenges, right, um, is what is an acre? Uh, and not to say we should, we can't answer this question, but our conservation parks, uh, we invest heavily in them for conservation parks, but dramatically different than um, uh, one example. Our spending at on Oberick Garden seven, eight acres is one point three million dollars a year, right? And then plus the capital we put into it. So that's an so we don't often use per acre type comparisons because they're just. There are some that literally park park spaces that literally receive probably three to twenty dollars a year per acre, uh, and some that receive hundreds of thousands per acre. But, but we can certainly give a large brand aggregate and or try to pull apart just maybe the quintessential take away the special facilities if that's helpful or show what those are even as their own standalone. Uh, Jim Cop. Eric, I, I agree with you, and I think um, the, the staff uh, of Ryan Thurn and uh, former staff Ray Shane would agree that as we go forward with this, and if we're going to keep Yahara as an operational golf course, there has to be a mindset that it's got to be a destination spot. With the size of the practice green, the size of the driving range, the clubhouse, you, you can really do some special things there. That are going to bring people, not the same folks that are going to be playing at Glenway or Monona, but avid golfers that are looking for a challenging place and has the facilities that accommodate um, large outings if they so want. Eric, I've got a question here because I think there's a lot of people that are, are listening in because they told me they were going to about MARGA. Um, they're telling me that MARGA's, which whole season has been canceled because there cannot be a compromise on how to collect daily fees. Um, any, what can I say to the people that stop me and ask me about that? Uh, I'm not aware of the the issue specifically, uh, or to speak with specificity. Uh, if you could, if we can unmute, is if Theron's on the line, I would hope that Theron or Theron or Ryan would be able to address it. I honestly was not prepared to talk about the. the I'm sorry. I apologize for catching you on, uh, with that surprise. That's not how I usually operate. It just happened to be over no. the weekend that I got. I was at you here, and I got stopped. And talking about 500 players a week that are not going to have their golfing association because we can't figure out how to take their money. 
Well, I mean, all I can say, the only thing I can speculate on while we try to get somebody else unmuted is if this involves cash handling, um, I mean, that, that could have been part. There, there are not certainly orders we're operating under right now that are not park division orders. And there are certain things we cannot do and we will not do. We're not going to violate. It was tough getting golf open. And if the orders that we're under indicate things that we must have D times paid online, right, uh, or buy a credit card over the phone, then I can't. I can't and I, I'm not saying it's what it is, but I can't have people paying in cash, even if that's what's convenient for them. Um, that's an order. That's not a. That's not a management decision. But I don't know if that's the root of it or not. And certainly. Um, like I said, if Theron or Ryan could jump in, they could they could maybe answer that better than I can. But I hadn't heard about it. So I just got unmuted so I can kind of fill in on that. So um, so that everybody knows, Marga is our Madison Area Tire Golfers Association. <clears throat> Save around 500 people, well, 500 rounds of golf that are played in our courses throughout the summer. Um, they We met with them. Jim, kind of answer your question. I think you got, you got a little bit of the gist of it, but I think you got an what somebody wanted to tell you. Absolutely. But it's not 500 per year. That's 500 per week. Per week. week. Yeah. Per week. So we met with Marga a week or so ago to discuss how we could put together the process to get them to play. Um, we went about a bunch of different scenarios. It really came down to is we can't collect the cash. Like, like Eric was saying, we can't have the people coming into the clubhouse. So what everything is right now is either booking online or booking over the phone. When we started looking at the booking over the phone aspect, we realized very quickly that 120 rounds per week are played at Glenway, which has one phone line. 95 plus percent of the golfers from Marga are all going to call. Do the quick math um, on a three to four minute phone call every time somebody calls. It's eight hours a week that are going to be devoted to Marga phone calls directly. That meant one full working day was going to be devoted to just taking Marga phone calls. So we couldn't answer phone calls from the general public to book tea times. It was going to tie us up pretty hard. So when we realized that we decided we'd get with Marga right away, it became very clear to us that there was a, a pretty strong divide between Marga of who wanted to play and who did not want to play with the restrictions. It sounded as though it came to um, either we want to be able to do everything normal like we have for years past or we don't want to play um we don't want to have to call in to make the reservations and we started formulating essentially trying to figure out a discounted way to get them to continue to play but having to pay more in advance so we put together a four-week plan a seven-week payment plan or a 14-week payment plan that they'd all pay in advance that way the phone calls would stop um it seemed as though about half the room was agreeing with the plan and wanted to move forward with it. And half the room didn't want to do anything unless it was just straight normal. So kind of a long story short, there was a disagreement within the group of what wanted to be done. We did everything in our power to, to try to get them to play. They're a huge, valuable asset to us and a big revenue generator um, for us. And they've been a partner for years. So we tried in everything we could to get them. They continue to play. We have to also recognize that they were losing numbers over the COVID because a lot of their players are high risk um, demographic, and a lot of them were falling out because they didn't feel comfortable playing. So, combined with those two items, is why they they pulled out for the year. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've been listening quietly, patiently, and, and I really appreciate all the comments and some of the, the ideas that we received through the surveys and the input. But I keep going back to our task at hand, and I guess maybe I'm looking for some personal clarification, is are we to decide or try to make a recommendation uh, based on what's best for the golf program and how do we preserve what we have or are we looking at a park system entirely? Well, I, I, I go back to my last 15 years of my career. It was all about keeping the golf program financially sustainable. And a lot of the, what I've heard 
some great ideas. I mean, I love the idea of having a Monona or Glenway open Sunday afternoons for family picnics and flying the kites and whatever activities you want to do, but that's going to have a financial impact obviously on the, on the golf program. And it's not going to make it any more sustainable. Um, rolling it into the parks division certainly takes the paperwork, financial paperwork off of the golf program, but it's just going to roll it into the parks division. So whether those cuts, because now the fleet charges are not directly towards golf, but are towards the parks division, it's still there. I mean, it doesn't really save in the city money. So I guess my rambling on is trying to get back to some sort of direction of the elders or the mayor or administration of our task is, is it what's best for the city open space? Is it best for the golf program? Is it best for the financial sustainability of the golf program? Uh, what is really a direction that we really should be focusing on? So, uh, and I appreciate the question, Ray. I feel like I'm I'm spinning here, and I, I think about it a lot, uh, but I think um, that, that's the benefit of having the resolution, and I, I certainly look to uh, Alder Hennick. He wanted to weigh in as well from his perspective on what a task versus job is, but the resolution is going back to it, so the, the task for the force that you all are. Solicit input from local stakeholders. That's a question you have to ask yourself as a group if we We've met that uh, burden. I mean, I, I personally think there's always more input to get. I think when you have a report, you'll get more, um, whether you want it or not. But there's, you know, 4,300 contacts is not insignificant. I think it's actually pretty substantial and um, pretty significant, like pretty significant level of engagement. Uh, many decisions have been made with fewer contacts. Um, prioritize equity, public health, financial sustainability, and environmental sustainability. Those are all balancing points, right? That's a tough one, right? Um, but, and then review available research, best practices, and operational models related to Mr. Golf. That's where, honestly, Ray, you brought up a lot of those questions. I think that's where it's going to be recommendations. Do we do you recommend as a group that we should at least contemplate an RFP for one or all the courses or something like that, right? And for operational models, you, you're a, a very seasoned veteran in the world of golf management. You could certainly draft a better recommendation I could even if that's a model that you know you guys know that best practices in many ways or at least you do very very well but then consider how to balance the allocation of resources among various uses that's kind of getting that same balancing act of um, you know if it's all parks we're just getting about the enterprise which is dangerous from the financial sustainability but if it's all parks even then how much golf should there be right is a question in itself do we have the right golf here is there actually too much golf because it is, you know, again, I don't want to get into raw percentages, but it is 17% of the park system currently, right? And and I don't think there's much evidence that says it's 17% of our population. I'm not playing that hard. I don't want to write that anywhere even. But, you know, I mean, just truthfully, that's a that's a known factor. And that's for you guys to help kind of balance because obviously land golf is a land-intensive use. Tennis doesn't need as much percentage for the same percentage of players. They're socially distant, I feel, on a court together. And then uh, the big one, though, but all those things come into the recommend if the city of Madison ought to provide municipal golf to the public. If so, recommend how much, where, and how. I mean, and how gets a little bit dicey where it may just be recommend how to explore how to operate it or to get better financial returns. And then those recommendations would be sent to the mayor, common council, committee, or commissions uh, on the future of Madison's municipal golf courses in the future. And, you know, for the future decision making. But I really think the way to think about it, and my perspective, I almost sent it out with the packet today and I stopped of saying resolved recommendations, where uh, it has it felt to me that this body in total, and this is one of the challenging parts for us as staff, right? We're trying to take what you all say, try to uh, wiggle that together into some kind of narrative that logical. I, I, feel, I feel the staff, and certainly this group can correct me. I feel on the recommend that the city of Madison ought to provide municipal golf to the public. I think the answer is yes, we ought to be in the business of golf and we ought to be in the business of golf to promote affordable and accessible golf. Those who aren't insured to have access if we rely solely on the private sector. 
And that's the primary reason. Now, we certainly have ancillary benefits of having what I'll call cross-subsidization of the 18-hole player who will pay the $45 at Odana, right, playing on a weekend. That player is paying forward in an enterprise model, if it can work, paying forward for that known 50% discount we're giving to the high school. Right. Uh-huh. For that. Um, so I think the first part of that, the answer has been from this group, though it had not been a vote, uh, I think by acclamation at a meeting two times ago, maybe. Uh, I think the answer is yes on the we should provide golf. The city ought to. And then if so, how much, where, and how is really where we're left at now. And for you guys, as a, for you as a task force, that's one of the things I'm trying to gauge today. If, if you would like us to issue a list of, we, we developed a list of recommendations. We can try to tie them together into the one we're hearing from you is the, the package that we think. Obviously, you all are going to vote on every recommendation you have directly, but it also becomes a challenge. Like one of the examples is we've got one that's kind of tied, that's not perfectly worded out, but the city should work with the University of Wisconsin team uh, to develop integrated pest management protocols that are at the forefront of managing public golf sustain, public courses sustainable. Right, and expressly stating it. We've heard concerns from folks who are concerned about pesticides and chemicals. I am too. Uh, mm-hmm. In the Winger watershed, well, all the watersheds, but the Winger watershed's hypersensitive to us in the city, for mainly because it's all our problem. Right, we are mm-hmm. responsible for that watershed uh, as a collective, Madison, and so that is certainly a tool to do it instead of being hyper prescriptive at a task force level of saying do X or Y specifically. It's we should set the standard and goal of being at the forefront, right? And having a plan that's later approved or reviewed by the commission and, and the like, that part of the, best, the talent we have in the city, right? That's where we should set the goal. And I think that's where the task force helps move us forward is give a recommendation because that alone, that recommendation from the task force, the way to think about it is you end up with five to 10 or 20 recommendations. Those recommendations will be looked at over the next five years to give guideposts of how do we make decisions? What should we think? And that's where the community use comes in, because, Ray, you're certainly right. I talk about closing Glenway after two. The main reason I talk about Glenway after two on Sundays is it's slow as heck right now. I can get by with it without giving up much revenue at all. I might be able to get a sponsor to do that and make it break even for this year. But, you know, knowing community use is something this task force has set as a vision will allow executional plans and strategies in the future with a basis, right? And, and you, Ray, specifically know these fights are real when it comes to finance fights about what's the basis for your direction. And this task force is really setting up that basis for a future of municipal golf. Now, how much and where? I'm looking at you all um, and what you need us to give you to help make that decision. Okay. Thank you. Veronica, you you have your hand up. Thank you so much. I just want to, I appreciate everyone's um, input in it and a great question. Um, I, also, um, with Eric and uh, Katie about maybe multi-use uh, golf course, um, but the question will be how the actual um, golfers will feel about it. Um, and also maybe uh, no closing, neither one, but maybe reducing calls. Um, I am not an engineer or architect, but uh, they can uh, have an idea of uh, if this really is going to work or not. Um, and uh, I really, Eric, I'm really looking for any recommendations. Thank you. And so for my part, I, I think we've, we've, we've got a lot of time and effort into this now, and, and I don't want us to just kick the can down the road, right? The city asked us to make some hard decisions and some good recommendations, and and I think we owe it to ourselves and to the process to to try and do that. Right? I don't want to. I don't want any kind of mushiness. I want us to give them some clear direction based on all of the analysis and and information gathering that we've that we've gotten. And you know, I have to say that I've done this a lot, and and it. I can feel that we're getting close to taking some decisions. So uh, we don't have very many, more, very many more meetings left. I think, how many, Eric, two or three? We have, we have two more scheduled. 
I have, because okay. one of the things for this group to know is we're not allowed to meet, but not <laughs> Paul, Paul is on here managing this call. We're, we don't meet right now without a coordinated effort from IT and others. So securing dates is really a challenge. That's why we're meeting on a Monday from our normal date. I have put in the request. I've been assured by the mayor's office that should this task force require an additional meeting, is what she said, exactly, to get done by the new deadline. I didn't leave with that earlier, July 31st. She would make sure that was able and accommodated. Um, so we have two on the books right now. Uh, I don't have the dates. Maybe Liz or somebody will jump in with the dates. June, July 2nd, I think. Um, I'm sorry, I turned the video off again. I was getting a lot of uh, the feedback. Um, our slow bandwidth, but um, so we have two more mid June and early July. Our deadline to the council to submit recommendations is the 31st of July. And those okay. dates are June 11th and July 2nd that are scheduled right now. Okay, well, we don't have very much time or together to, but I want you to start thinking about it. We, we, need to make some decisions. And I actually feel like I've uh, earth-shaking details that are going to sort of change my mind about what I think needs to be done. And I'm suspecting that a lot of you all feel the same way. Whatever it is, you know, I think you've, I think you've sort of formulated some strategies and recommendations in your mind. And so now we'll just have a good, robust conversation and come to some consensus our next meeting and, ju and just to jump back in real quick so the draft the draft report which again which is absent recommendations you'll see where they fit in has been updated for the second re secondary resolution which gave us the extension and those kind of things covers information gathering the outreach and input um the uh, initial findings is blank but then it goes up uh, or goes back through the earlier draft you saw is now i would say 80 percent done and as soon as the um the survey uh, information is complete and financial information is updated and double checked one more time because it's a published document with quite a bit of financial information in it. We will post that on Legistar, attach the item tonight. And we will let you all know, the public can certainly see that it will be on the same agenda item will appear again on the next meeting. So you'll see it then, if not before, we will be able to see it before then. I expect that to be posted early next week at the latest. And you'll see kind of the format that might help you. After we've been delivered tonight, that might help you kind of ease out some more of these thoughts or directions of what you what you've seen or what how it fits in. Okay, so um, Miss Vega, your hand is still up. Do you have another comment? Okay, so with that, I think. Our time is almost up. I thank you very much for your time tonight, and I uh, will entertain a motion to adjourn. Alder Hennick raises his hand. Chandra Miller, second. All right. Well, very cool. Thanks very much, and I'll see you all sometime down the road.